do without that big light blasting up here unless unless you need it, Eugene. Do you need that? No. Can we can that thing? Yes. That's okay. That would be great. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Papa. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word that comprehends us. Your word that understands us. Your word that sustains us in existence. Your word that upholds us. Your word that invented us, that designed us, that created us. Your word that comes to bring clarity into this beautiful mystery. Thank you, Papa. Thank you for communicating yourself this evening. Thank you for this beautiful communication in which you reveal yourself. And as we see you, we, we are stunned with the, with the surprise of discovering our true selves in you. We thank you for this mystery. Papa, I ask for boldness and for clarity to make known this mystery. Thank you for your eagerness to reveal yourself. Mm. Thank you, thank you, thank you for a spirit of revelation and understanding and knowledge. <laughs> Ooh, thank you, Papa. Thank you, thank you. Mm. Thank you. We're just going to so delve into this mystery of the the incarnation of the God uh, becoming a man the God the word becoming flesh and you know what when we speak about Jesus we're not just speaking about a person who lived thousands of years ago and we when we when we tell the story of Jesus Many might ask, you know, well, what does that have to do with my story? Well, I hope that tonight you will realize that his story is your story. That he comes to reveal the true God and that you are in him who is true. That, uh, you know, Jesus once asked his disciples who do men say that I am? And you know, there are many religious options and there are many points of view and you can make your pick as the disciples. Some say this, some say that, but tonight I just sense the Lord is standing in front of each one of you and say, saying, I've had enough of that opinions. Who do you say that I am? And when you realize who he is, that is the day <laughs> in which you meet yourself for the first time as well. <laughs> oh, thank you, Papa. Who is Jesus? John starts this uh, this wonderful discovery, and he says, in the beginning was the word. The word logos speaks about the inner motivation, a, a, a logic. Logic is one of the words we get from that word logos, but it's more than just the logic. It's, it's the reasoning, the motivation, and how that motivation is expressed. So the logos of God, the, that word is not just uh, not just some theory, this is the very heart of God, the very motivation of God. This word that was in the beginning was with God, face to face with God. Can you see that the, the ultimate place where this word will lead you to is not to a theory, but to a place which is beyond all words, to a place which is face to face 
with your maker. And this word was such an accurate expression of the motivation and the heart of God that John can say this word was God. So the first thing I want to focus on, we're going to hopefully get to the two parts, maybe join them together later on. But the first part I want to focus on tonight is that Jesus is God. Um, he is fully, completely God. Uh, Hebrews 1 says, 1 verse 1, in various ways and in various forms, God spoke to the prophets of old through fragments and pieces. But in these last days, he has spoken a final word in his son. Jesus is not just another fragment of this revelation. Jesus is not just another piece. He is the complete, the final word. Verse 3 says he is the exact representation of the character and the nature of God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is not false advertising for a secretly vengeful God who still wants to get you. Now, Jesus is the exact representation of the character and the nature of God. You see, in the in the time that Jesus appears, we've had, mankind has had lots of opportunities through our own philosophies and our own guesses to try and know God. And hey, when we look at the, the most popular Greek philosophies at those times, you know, they came up with the idea, now obviously there's a hunger in man for peace, for satisfaction, and so the idea of peace, they had this idea of a, a place of perfect tranquility, a place where there is no uh, pain, no worry, where no anxiety, whether of mind or of body. It's just the place which is the absence of all problems. That is their idea of tranquility. And therefore, as a result, they would theorize about their gods and obviously their gods are in this place of perfect tranquility. And therefore, they are far away from you. Because your life is not the absence of pain and trouble. Their God sits on a cloud far away and he observes this world. And he, he sees a war and he sees a baby being born. He sees a marriage and he sees a murder and, and their gods are unmoved. You know, Paul speaks to the, the philosophers in Acts 17, the Stoics and the Epicureans. Now, the Epicureans basically had that philosophy of the gods cannot, <laughs> they just do, do not care. Because if they did care, they would lose their peace and their tranquility. Now, the Stoics went a, a step further and they said, the God, it's not that God uh, d does not care. He cannot care. He's just uh, impersonal and emotional intelligence. Now, we would think, of course, the Jews got it right. I mean, they had the word. They had the Torah. They had the revelation of God. And, I mean, uh, Psalms 19 says, all of creation shouts out the glory of God. And then from verse 7, and then the word comes. And the word is perfect. The word is clear. But you see, whenever you start with an attempt to know God through trying to describe him just in nature, We've never ended up with the one true God. We've always ended up with idolatry. And now Paul makes this amazing statement. Even the Torah, of course, it witnesses to the true God, just like all creation. But it never brought man to the final conclusion and revelation 
And so even those who embrace the Torah most closely just revealed their secret faults and <laughs> exposed them more clearly. And so, you know, if the Jews had it right, then Jesus would not have said in Matthew eleven twenty seven, no one knows the Father except the Son. Hey, despite your thousands of years of Bible study, you had it wrong. Despite all the rituals, all the meetings, um, you are wrong. <laughs> he says, no one knows the Father except the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father. You see, here, here God comes in the person of Christ to reveal himself in such a way that what he reveals would not be filtered, would not be diluted. This is God on display. He does not want to be misunderstood. Now, what was one of the major focuses of the Jewish um, thought of that day? They focused in on the holiness of God. And for them, holiness meant his utter separation from us. God is transcendent. He is beyond all that we can imagine. And of course, there's always truth in things that take our focus. And there's truth in that. But you see, the result of that kind of um, emphasis on his transcendence, on his otherness, on his holiness resulted in a God that was distant as well, a God that was unknowable, a God who was unapproachable. This is why Jacob can say, I have seen the face of God and yet I live. Um, to see him is to die. He's so different. And uh, so the doctrines of angels became exaggerated to the point where, although we clearly read in the Old Testament that it was God himself who gave the Lord to Moses, by New Testament times we have at least two instances where it says it was actually an angel. Because God is so different, it couldn't have been him. It must have been the traditions developed that now there's many intermediaries. He's far away. It was angels. And so in their mindset as well, um, although they obviously through the rev God's self-revelation in the word, um, it brought a lot of light and a lot of correction. Uh, the, the interpretation resulted again, and understandably so. Fallen man within broken relationship interprets everything to justify the distance, to justify the, the unapproachableness of God. Yeah, God comes <laughs> in the person of Jesus Christ. The word becomes flesh, and he reveals himself as Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. The incarnation is God's declaration that I do not want to be God by myself, with myself. Or for myself. The only way in which I want to be God <laughs> is with man, for man, and as a man. This is God Himself making the choice to become man. No, no one ever thought of that. That would have been blasphemy to have suggested it. But this is His choice. And you know what? The incarnation is not just a plan B. This wasn't the son and the father sitting together and saying, boy, they've messed it up. And even with my word, they are going the wrong direction. One of us will have to go down there and sort out this mess. And Jesus drew the short straw. And so he came grudgingly and 
you know, just endured this pathetic existence for 30 years, just hardly being able to wait, almost looking forward to the cross so that he could escape this existence. No, the incarnation, remember, this is the God who knows the end from the beginning. God knew that he would become a man before he designed man. Before Adam existed, God knew he would become a man. And so he designed man in such a way that man would be compatible with him. That, as Colossians 1.19 tells us, it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. It didn't irritate God to exist in the form of a man, it pleased the Father. He became a man first and foremost because he wanted to. This is the God who does all things according to the good pleasure of his own purpose and will. That's how Ephesians is translated. Basically what it means, he does everything he does because he wants to. And so, so God becomes a man not out of necessity, but God becomes man because he always wanted to. <laughs> Woo! Man. Man. And what does he reveal about God? Remember, he's the exact representation of the character and nature of God. He reveals a God who's not at a distance. He reveals a God who's involved in every detail of your life. He reveals a God who cares about the hairs on your head. He reveals a God who's um, occupied with, with, with in real life, in, in children, in people being sick, in people facing problems. He, he just wants to be with people. You, need, you know, whatever you believe, however, you, however correct your, you think your doctrine is, if your faith, your belief, do not lead you to the place where you enjoy people. What, what is its value? I mean, if you think your doctrine is absolutely correct, but people irritate you and you can't stand yourself, this is exactly what John says in 1 John 1 verse 7. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, it results in uninterrupted enjoyment of one another. The, this, the enlightenment that this word brings can be clearly seen in the enjoyment it produces. If your doctrine justifies you grudging or hating or separating the, yourself from some, hey, you obviously don't believe what Jesus believed. Because what Jesus believed made him attractive to the unaccepted in a, a society. I mean, in Luke 15, it's the prostitutes, the tax collectors, I mean, that's much worse than prostitutes. They, the guys that went out and, and sold out their, their countrymen who, who um, I mean, they, these guys were hated. Yet, they saw something in Jesus that made them flock. What is it in Jesus that they saw? I mean, if I just wanted another sermon that told them how rotten they are, they could have gone to any synagogue in town. But they came to Jesus because in him something in his eyes reminded them of the innocence they once knew. 
something in him reminded them that for some reason God still believes in me. He recognizes a value that I might have forgotten. But they flock to him. You see, Jesus comes and reveals a God whose peace is not so fragile that he has to keep his distance to remain at peace. He reveals a peace that has such integrity that he can embrace your life with all its contradictions, with all its problems. In fact, he can embrace this world <laughs> with all its sin and all its troubles reconcile it to himself and remain at peace. You see, God is forging in the incarnation a union between himself and humanity, but it was a very specific humanity. Um, Romans 8 verse 3, it says he came in the form of sinful flesh. Now, we've got a problem here because God and sinful man don't sinful humanity don't mix something's gonna give <laughs> Woo! but he's not the one that's gonna withdraw <laughs> he forges a union with humanity <laughs> and what's gonna give <laughs> is the sinfulness of man He's going to forge this union. He comes to unite himself with humanity, to take back what is his. He comes to his own. Now, how long does a thief need to be in possession of what he stole before what he stole becomes his? Never. But in our theology, we have given ownership to the father of lies. He owns nothing and no one. Psalms 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This world and those who dwell in it, God believes they are all his. And so he comes to his own and yes, some of his own did not receive him. And some of his own now has not received him. But that doesn't change his mind. He knows you are his. <laughs> he knows. And so Jesus comes to display a God who's not at a distance. He comes to settle once and for all the deception of separation. This alternative identity that man chose, that I can be happy, satisfied by myself without God. He comes to bring to a final end that sense of separation. And he reveals a God who has always been with us. Because this is the God who gives you life and breath. And everything. This is the God who, without Him being present, you would not exist. I mean, this is why God can keep man responsible for sin, because sin is not something that you do in your own time with your own energy. You don't have your own time or your own energy. This is the God in whom all things consist. This is the very time and the very energy that he supplied that we used and twisted and turned against him. That's why he could keep man responsible for that. And that's why he comes to deal with it. And he does it in such a way to show us that, you know what, I understand the depth of everything you've experienced. I understand even the depth of sin and he comes in the form of sinful flesh yet we know without sinning because but it becomes man so fully that he is even tempted in all ways as we are 
I'll get to the man part. I, I, I switch between this. But, but what he reveals about God is a God oh, that's, uh, can you just for a moment imagine how close God is to you? And maybe stretch your imagination. Maybe imagine him closer than what you have ever imagined him before. You know what? However close you imagine God to be, he is closer. Whatever thought you are about to think, he's already worked it out. He knows every word you're going to speak, whether it rhymes. <laughs> he knows you better than what you know yourself. So Jesus comes to reveal a God who is not at a distance, a God who is with me. And uh, his holiness, whoo, his holiness. His holiness is not his separation from us. His holiness is his utter and complete separation unto us. This is what he reveals when he empties himself into human form. Philippians 2. What, what does it mean? It means that God bankrupted heaven. He emptied himself. He emptied heaven in, into humanity. You see, the gospel is not that one day you can go to heaven. The gospel is God saw greater value in you than in heaven. That's why he left heaven and invested himself into you, into your humanity. The good news starts right here, right now. Jesus tells the story about a, a man who sees an agricultural field, and he, f he finds great treasure within that field. Now, that field, that field would normally have a certain value based upon the, the effort you put into it. You could expect a cert certain harvest. But this man discovers a treasure within that field unrelated to the sweat and effort that had to go into reap a harvest, a treasure hidden. And so he goes and he doesn't just bargain for the best price based on its agricultural value. He just sells everything he has to buy this field. Hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Woo! God has invested himself into humanity. He's got no other interest. He's got no other hobby. He's got no other investment. He's got no other race on another planet just in case you don't work out. He has burnt every bridge. He has become man. Not just for 30 years. God is still a man in the person of Jesus Christ. Can you see the enormity of his commitment? He has forever united his own existence, his own destiny with that of humanity. Can you see why he is so committed to your freedom? Can you see why he is so committed to your freedom? Because your freedom equals his freedom. Man, God, Jesus comes to reveal a God whose holiness is his utter and complete separation unto us. He comes to reveal a God who wants to be known but he is only known in one place. It is still only the Son who knows the Father. And it's still only the Father who knows the Son. In Jesus, God knows man. And in Jesus, man knows God perfectly. And it is in this union, in this fellowship, that we are drawn into. 
he knows the Father for you. He knows, he reads the scriptures for you. This is why you are called into the fellowship of his son. You are not called to work out your own unique little way of knowing God. Jesus has known the Father, and he wants to draw you into the same quality of intimacy, of knowledge, of fellowship that he has of the Father. That's why we only know God in Him. In Him, in Him, in Him. Hey, He reveals a God who will never leave you nor forsake you. A God who will even enter your hell with you. But He will not turn His face from the afflicted. Nor will He hide himself from you this is a God who is utterly committed to you but Jesus is also fully man and so I want to just I just sense the Lord wants me to remind you of this over and over again who do you say that I am who do you say that I am? Are you starting to see the significance of the person of Jesus Christ? Jesus is also a fully man. And as man, ha, 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 as man, God is not reduced in person when he becomes a man. <laughs> this is what a beautiful mystery. The eternal God becomes flesh and he is not reduced to something less than God. He is still fully God. Can you, can you see the design that he had in mind? He knew he was going to become a man long before he designed man and so he designed man in such a way to be compatible with himself but he also knew this that once I make this commitment to become man I will remain a man forever and so God designs man not just compatible with himself but as his favorite form of existence. <laughs> uh, hey, hey, now you might ask, oh, my goodness, what was God thinking? Because, um, I mean, doesn't he know the limitations? Uh, being human and being omnipotent is not quite the same. Being human and being omnipresent is not quite the same. But you see, God starts revealing. He revealed it so clearly in Christ. But he starts whispering to Paul and he says, You know, Paul, let me tell you something about myself. Um, if... If I have all the knowledge there is, if I'm omniscient, yet I have not love, I am nothing. What is God saying to Paul? You know, Paul, it is not my omniscience that makes me me. He says, and Paul, you know what? If, if you have all the faith in the world to move mountains... If you have all the power, uh, if you're even omnipotent, but you have not love, you're nothing. What is he telling Paul? He says, you know, Paul, I know you guys are very impressed with the spectacular and with the miraculous and with, the, with my omnipotence, but you know what? That's not really what makes me, me. <laughs> You see, it's not the omniscience, the omnipotence, the omnipresence that makes God, God. And I think he knew 
Because in the Old Testament, he reveals his omnipotence in grander and bigger scale than ever before. And what was the end result of all that spectacular display? No one knew the Father except the Son. It's as if God knew that man would be distracted by all these other qualities. Let me show man who I really am. And so let's strip away everything that is not essentially me. And so God could become a man, could lay aside divine privileges, become a man and not in any way be reduced in being God. Why? Because God in essence is love. And the human existence is in no way a limitation for the love of God to be manifested. <laughs> Woo! Man, I'm getting excited. <laughs> and so we see God more clearly in the human face of a man who's torn apart willingly for your benefit <laughs> we see the glory of God not in the spectacular fireworks but in this shameful act of dying a criminal's death in it he reveals his love <laughs> So God becomes man. What was God thinking? Well, maybe he was thinking something like this. If I had to step into this dimension of time and space, what would it look like? Can I design a being through which I can experience this world and through which this world can experience me? I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> In fact, I think I'm going to just reach into myself, us. Let's bring forth man, our image, our likeness. You know, about 20 years ago, we couldn't imagine that the contents of a library could fit into one little USB stick. But a new technology has opened up a whole new dimension. Now, when Stephen stands before the Sahedrin shortly before he is stoned, he tells them, heaven and earth cannot contain him. And you know, in the Jewish tradition, they had a specific term it was a derogatory term that they used to describe the idols of the pagans. They would call the, the idols, um, the idols gods made by human hands. And that was the, the derogatory term to just show it's nothing. It didn't originate in God. It is man's imagination. It's an idol made with human hands. And Stephen stands before them and he says, you know what? Heaven and earth does not contain him. Neither does he dwell in this temple made by human hands. And he points to the most sacred symbol, the most sacred institution, and basically says, hey, it's just another man-made thing. Heaven and earth cannot contain him, but a body. Just quickly look at the person next to you. Can you see a body? What heaven and earth cannot contain, a body he has prepared. God has engineered a technology called image and likeness to contain what this universe cannot. He's more concentrated 
in your person than anywhere else. I mean, what beauty we see in nature. We can be overwhelmed with its awesomeness, its beauty, its color. But nowhere can God unfold the beauty of his own person more accurately than in your person, than in his image and his likeness. Ah. Can you see what's happening here in this God-man union of Jesus Christ? He reveals the true God, and he reveals true man. John 1.14, the word became flesh, is God's explanation, commentary on Genesis 1.26, when he said, man is my image and my likeness. Here the word becomes flesh and he comes and displays to us what he had in mind. You see, we always read verse 14 and we think that just refers to Jesus, and of course it does. He is the word that was in the beginning, that was with God, that was God, the word that became flesh. But you know verse 13 and the verses just after 15 is speaking about you. Verse 13 says, you were born of God, and the thoughts of God became flesh. And tabernacled in us. You remember the tabernacle? The tabernacle was that very mobile dwelling made out of skin. God knew exactly what pictures and types he was putting in place for us to better understand what he was doing. Ah, the tabernacle was his idea. The the, the temple that was man's idea the tabernacle hey god loves the mobility and the simplicity of a skin dwelling ah. so the word you were born of god the word became flesh god doesn't just think thoughts about you you are a thought of god in flesh form and tabernacled in us. And of his fullness have we all received grace upon grace upon grace. <laughs> Woo, man. Jesus is fully God and he is fully man. As God he expects perfect obedience. Jesus, as man, gives it. Jesus, as God, expects um, perfect metanoia, metanus, to come to your senses, repentance. So, so Jesus, as man, goes to John the Baptist and John, what was he doing? He was baptizing people, a baptism of repentance. And, and Jesus says, you need to baptize me. And John says, no way. I mean, you have no need of repentance. And he says, no, do this so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. You see what Jesus did? He didn't do for himself. He did it as your representative. He obeyed for you. He repented for you. He believed for you. Does that mean that you don't have to believe or agree? Or what? No, man, that's just a stupid conclusion. It means that the, 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 the perfect obedience, the perfect faith has already been given. And it's now offered to you as a free gift. Ah, free gift. <laughs> Woo. God and man united. You see, the, the destiny of God's word was never an institution. 
it was never a doctrine. It was not even a book. The destiny of God's word, the ultimate expression of his thought, was always human life. And this is when, why when Paul tells us his message, he says, For, with all the energy I have and beyond my own energy, how he takes me beyond the point of exhaustion. I just want to make all men see. I just, what does he want them to see? Christ, not in the past. Christ, not in the future. But Christ, not even in a book. But Christ in you. And that is what makes the scripture so precious. They point. They point towards a reality greater than themselves. The reality of the word made flesh. And you. And you. See, John at one stage, and maybe many of you have come to that point because you know, now John at one stage John the Baptist he saw so clearly he said this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world but then you know circumstances situations contradicted that place and, and he came to a place of such disappointment in prison awaiting his sentence and so he sends messengers to Jesus and he says, Are you the one who was to come? Or should we wait for another? And I think many people have maybe come to that place in their lives where the, the situation has forced you to reevaluate your faith and say, Is this Jesus really the one? who was to come or, or should we wait for another and, and you know unfortunately there's, there's many who have answered that question they might not have said it as plainly as I'm going to say it now they might have covered it up in beautiful end time theories and amazing eschatological doctrines but basically what they're saying is you know what? We've made up our minds. The Jesus that came is not quite it. We better hope that he would come again. And hopefully this time he does it properly. And we, we insult the work of the cross by putting our hope in a future event. And what was lacking all along it's not the success of what he has done, but the appreciation, the revelation that we needed to understand that everything that needed to be done for you to live in a continual awareness of union with God, it has happened. He has come. The distance is cancelled. Sin is no longer the issue. Ignorance is. But thank God for the proclamation of the gospel. <laughs> Woo. Oh, man. So Jesus becomes a man. He partakes in every possible way. In the depth of your humanity, he partakes of it. He experiences in his life, he demonstrates that he experiences everything you have ever experienced. He is tempted in all ways like you are. He, he faces the pain. He faces the injustice. And on the cross, this is the place where he brings it to a final conclusion. You see, the reason why God can tell you that you can get over your past and that you need to forget it is not because he doesn't understand the pain or the injustice or the shame or the guilt. It's because he understands it better than what you understand it. 
It's because he took that shame, that pain, that injustice, and in one moment, the once and for all sacrifice. He, he didn't take it lightly. It's because he experienced everything you experienced. Not just what you've experienced in the past. He has lived your whole life with you, even the part you haven't lived yet. He has taken hold of every contradiction, every obstacle that could ever be between you, and he settled it forever on the cross. So finally that Hebrews 10 verse 17 says, I will no longer think of your sin. I will remember it no more. You see, what is the basis upon which we can have a clear conscience? It's on the basis that God has cleansed his own conscience, that he no longer remembers your sin, that he thinks of it no more, that there is not one thought in God concerning you that reminds him of sin. He sees the truth. He's not deceiving himself. Man. And when you come to the same conclusion, what a glorious life opens. When you suddenly realize that he tells me that the old things are past Behold, the new has come. He doesn't say, behold the old. There's only one thing he says about the old. It's past. It's gone. It's history. Now behold the new. You can afford to just let go. Let go of the guilt. Let go of the shame. Let go of the disappointment and trust that he has dealt with it justly, thoroughly, completely in such a way that with all confidence you can just take hold of resurrection life and say, from now on, <laughs> what's next, Papa? What's next? You see, Jesus... I mean, just as his peace was not so fragile that he had to keep his distance, he reveals resurrection life, a life of such integrity that it's not resurrection life because it avoids death. It's resurrection life because it uh, faces the worst that evil can do to it and says to evil, hey, give me your best shot. And even if you kill me, I will just rise again. See, this is, this is a life that, that God is not nervous. His will is not so fragile that he's scared that if you make one wrong move, you're out of it and it's going to take months to get back. No, God, you know, once I was just so searching for God's plan for my life. And you know, this times where that is good but I was in that real place of searching and eventually I just heard the Lord saying Andre stop searching for my plan for your life thought, I, I, you know, I thought that's a good thing to do and he said just realize that your life is my plan God wants to live his life through you and he's a God of spontaneity. He's a God of such creativity. He's a God that so trusts the image and the likeness that he created you in and that he redeemed you in Christ. And all he wants you to do is to see what he sees, know what he knows concerning yourself, and when you see yourself, just be yourself. And so I'm going to just end off with that question that Jesus asked again. Who do you say that I am? You know, I've made up my mind 
I'm not going to insult the Jesus that came. I'm not going to insult him in my eschatology, insult him in my end time theories, insult him in any other doctrine that reduces his achievement to just some theoretical possibility. What Jesus has done is real. He has canceled all distance between God and man. He has removed every obstacle. And if I'm still aware of distance, it's not because he's deceived. If I'm still aware of distance and obstacles, it's not because he was a failure. Psalm 17 verse 15 says, I will be satisfied when I behold your face. Uh, where I will be satisfied when I behold your face. Uh, um, when I awake in your likeness. Awake. Awake to the success of what Jesus has done. God is closer to you than what you have ever imagined. And he is so anticipating living his life through you. He's excited about his, your life because he's excited about his life. He's never regretted emptying heaven and investing himself into your humanity. He's excited about your life. And if you're not excited, it's just because you don't see what he sees. If you see what he sees, you become excited <laughs> about your life as well. Glory. Mary Ann, can I ask you to get ready? And she's got some songs that so beautifully captivates this. And I want to encourage you. We, we've, we're going to make all of this available on our website, hearing.net. And um, 